Okay, so I'm uh, uh, officially retired, uh, but also uh, from uh, uh, academia, but still very active. And uh, indeed, I will present a, a project uh, that we have been running in this beautiful institute that you see here for the past uh, uh, five years, four or five years. And uh, um, also, I am a, a president of the Fondation Maladie Rare in France, which is important to um, help research on uh, rare disease. Okay, so uh, uh, what I will tell you is about this project of, uh, that uh, we started uh, about five years ago, of uh, a new way of collecting information on rare disease, uh, in this case on uh, the genetic forms of intellectual disability. Sorry, I just uh, have to check that I don't go over time. Uh, this is a project where actually it's the parents of affected uh, uh, children or even affected adults that actually will fill the information. So it's a participatory cohort and database study for uh, genetic forms of intellectual disability. And uh, uh, here are the, uh, the, the people involved. Uh, and uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, Florent Collin, who has been the, the manager of the project uh, since the, the, the start, but also a very important collaboration with a very well-known clinical geneticist in Nijmegen, David Kuhlen and Tietzke Klefstra, and this was very important for us to get actually uh, uh, cohorts of families who are willing to answer the, the questionnaire and to let us analyze the results. And uh, we have, of course, all the support that we can think for doing this. So uh, why uh, intellectual disability? Intellectual disability is actually a common condition since it affects about uh, uh, 1.5 to 2% of children and young adults. And uh, it's about 0.5% for the more severe forms of intellectual disability, and that it can be with or without autism, with or without epilepsy. And why in a rare disease workshop? Because in fact, now, thanks to uh, high throughput sequencing and uh, all the genomic uh, uh, tools we have now, we estimate that about 50 to 60% of the case of, of people with intellectual disability, uh, there is one major genetic cause. But actually, it's now when evaluate that maybe thousand different genes or uh, copy number variants can be, when mutated, be responsible for intellectual disability. So in fact, it is a thousand rare disease. And the number is increasing because I think every month there are two or three more uh, genes implicated in intellectual disability or autism or epilepsy, etc. So that means that there is, in general, very limited information on the uh, uh, clinical aspects, the comorbidities, and the natural history. Uh, in many cases, uh, this has been described only for a few patients uh, at a given time in, in the first publication. If even if there are a few more publications, you don't have really data about the natural history and comorbidities and what are the meaningful medical problems linked to this intellectual disability or behavioral problem. So how can we efficiently build cohorts of patients and obtain sufficient and thorough data to identify the information of medical interest? So, of course, in general, what you uh, say that there should be database made by specialists, by MDs, by academic specialists who are interested in the condition. But remember, it is a thousand different disease. And of course, these, if they are done, will be accurate with respect to mutation description, clinical description related to the main known manifestation. But the academic specialists are very busy and often they see only once or twice the patient. They don't follow the patient after that, especially in intellectual disability, where you don't have a very specific treatment that you need to go to an academic center 
to have this treatment. So it's more the GPs or the child psychiatrist or a neurologist or educators who, and the parents who follow the patients. But all these professionals have little incentive to spend time to fill lengthy questionnaires. And I'll just very quickly give two examples. For instance, there is one of the most frequent copy number variant that is responsible for neurodevelopmental problems. This is the recurrent uh, deletion or duplication in 16P11.2. Now, the deletion started to be published in actually, I think, a New England Journal of Medicine, very prestigious journal, saying it was associated with autism. And it took more than two years for a, for a new publication saying that actually one of the most penetrant comorbidity of this deletion was actually morbid obesity that was frequent and starting only at the age of seven or eight. But obesity is not difficult, of course, to recognize. But if you see a single patient and by chance he's obese, you don't know whether this is part of the condition or not. You need to see several patients. And for the duplications, uh, at first it was published as associated to autism or schizophrenia in Nature Genetics, and it took 3.5 years to recognize that one of the problems that the families recognized as the most important was a major feeding disorder, a tip, uh, kind of anorexia-like uh, disorder. And for Fragile X, it took, since the discovery of the mutation in 91, it took 10 years to discover that the people who have in the family what is called the premutation, I won't go into the details, are actually at very high risk of a late onset neurological phenotype, which is now named FAXTAS, Fragile X uh, Mental Resonation uh, uh, Ataxia Syndrome, Tremor Ataxia Syndrome. So it took 10 years and actually it was really discovered not really uh, initially through, through the families. So this I, I, I will pass. And just to give you this example for the paper in Nature, reporting actually that was a feeding phenotype and extreme BMA phenotype associated to um, uh, duplication in chromosome 16P11.2. This required a paper with about 180 co-authors. There are two co-authors per patient because there are 108 patients who, uh, whose data are, are shown in this, uh, this paper. So you see that if you want to do this, the kind of things for a thousand different conditions, this is hopeless. And also there are even for very well known uh, conditions like Prada-Willi syndrome, which is not so, it's a rare disease, but not, not so rare. Lots of people working on it, lots of publication, but it is through the uh, uh, patient association in France, Prader-Willi, who actually said to the Minister of Health that there should be an emergency card for Prader-Willi patients within red, formal contraindication to benzodiazepine and any other drug that may uh, de uh, depress respiration. And why uh, did they push for this? because they knew of very major, apparently fatal, results of treatment with ben benzodiazepine, but it was outside of academia, you know, when they were living uh, in a protected environment or whatever, and there is not a single publication about, among the thousands of publications in Prada Willy, there is a, not a single publication saying that benzodiazepine may be dangerous, but, what they said was convincing enough for the Minister of Health to put this on this emergency card. So, our, the objective of our project is to collect longitudinal health data on these many forms of intellectual disability through direct internet precipitation of families. They answer to a structured multiple choice question on the internet, and they are uh, also five open answer questions concerning major health and quality of life problems. 
The questionnaire is currently in five different languages, French, English, Dutch, German, and Portuguese. The website is for the moment only in English and French. And uh, we can also, if necessary, elaborate some uh, more specific questions. And uh, it allows professionals and family, or this is the hope, to access the identify statistically analysis. Actually, it's, it is already uh, done for uh, some of the larger cohorts. And so what we want to have is novel and medical significant knowledge that can be translated in improved personalized healthcare. So for instance, there are no question about dysmorphia because the patient and the families uh, don't care about having a low implanted ears or a bulbous nose. What they are, is there a, a problem with, uh, for, are there digestive problems? Are there neurological problems associated? What are the behavioral problems that the patient and the family face? And so this is participating so they can directly participate. And it's a platform also where professionals and families can uh, interact to, uh, if they have additional specific questions, if these questions are approved by uh, our advisory board and, uh, and those uh, promote interactions between patients and professionals. So we have a website. Uh, you have here the, the, uh, the address of the website. You just type Janida and you will find it, where the families can read the uh, informed consent. And this has been uh, actually approved by ethic committees in France. They can registrate and uh, um, then uh, they uh, can start answering the questionnaire. Uh, now, all this is uh, uh, totally anonymous. Uh, we uh, ask them only for uh, actually not their name and address, but just actually an email. And the email list is kept in a totally separate computer. So you cannot go from the Genida side to the list of people who have actually answered questions. And so they can answer the questionnaire. They can get a PDF copy of their own answers, which may be useful if they talk to other doctors or they have everything they have put here about the condition of their uh, child. Um, and they can have access for the larger cohort to the statistical visualizations of the data, uh, anonymized, of course. So here is an example of the questionnaire, some open question to look for general things about what affects the most quality of life, the, the health, the behavior problems. And then there are uh, 41 multiple choice questions and then sub questions. So for instance, the, if you um, say, if they answer yes, there are cardiac problems, then they will have a list of sub-questions to try to see a little bit more in details what kind of cardiac problem. And if they want to put open text, because uh, in the sub-question they don't see what they uh, think they should, uh, one should know, they will uh, put this in, uh, in open text. And this is an example of the PDF of answer that parents can download. So it takes four or five pages. So this is the open text questions and major medical problems, adverse effects uh, following medication, cognitive problems. And this is some example of the multiple choice question about, uh, for instance, communication ability, speech ability, etc. So there is also, of course, a Facebook page. And this is actually to try to connect to various face group, uh, groups for individual disease. And, uh, and we have very international followers, if you can see. So this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we put, uh, when we have encounters with associations at a meeting, for instance, we post this on our Facebook page. And this is more important. This is the current state. We have now more than 800 families who actually filled the questionnaire for a given, for, 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 for a child or adult actually, stating what gene or what CNV is affected for. And so for instance, thanks to David Kuhlen and Titske Kleftra in Nijmegen, uh, who are very close to patients association and told them, 
Janida is a very interesting thing. You should fill the questionnaire. We have more than 200 patients documented now for Kuhlen de Vries syndrome and 100 patients for uh, Kleffser syndrome. But we have also, uh, you know, uh, these are some of our others, larger cohorts, anchoring the L1, the KDG syndrome, uh, and MEF13L is a more recent one, etc. So what we hope, of course, is to go from 800 to several thousand so that we would have many more genes documented. Uh, you see it's very international. Uh, France, one third. US, 25%. UK, 14%. Netherlands, 5%. And many other countries. And this is for Kuhlen de Vries, our larger cohort. Uh, actually, it's half from the US because the uh, association, uh, Kuhlen Syndrome Foundation, is very uh, keen on uh, collaborating with us. And so we ask a thing, are they digestive problem? Or are there hearing problems, feeding problems, cardiac problems? And this is what we call the overview, where you see, for instance, that uh, most of them have ID. Many have vision problems. But for instance, there are few ha who have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or they don't have vascular problems, or there is no cancer. And here we actually compare this a percentage obtained in Janida of two publications of about 30, 32 patients that have appeared in uh, normal journals. And you see that the data are uh, very similar. For instance, here uh, we found 49% report epilepsy. This is compared to 50% in one paper, 49%. It's almost too good to be true, but it's this. Or hearing problems we have 41% and there's 25% in the published papers. R is based on 200 and they are based on 30. But uh, we'll see that, for instance, there is 40% of the people or more who reported respiratory and public, uh, pulmonary problems. And this is not at all apparent in the two published papers. There is no mention on, of any respiratory pulmonary problems probably because it seemed too unrelated to a neurodevelopmental disease. I will go back. So for instance, here for epilepsy, not only they, do they tell whether the child has epilepsy, but they will say what type of epilepsy, tonic-clonic seizure or absent seizures or nocturnal seizures, and whether this is a major problem, a moderate problem, or a mild problem. Because if there was a child who has once a seizure, a mild seizure, or has some EG abnormalities, but it's not really a big problem, he's not on a treatment, then uh, we, we would know whether, for instance, you see, the tonic-clonic seizures are the most frequent, and they are indeed of a lot of concern for parents. Also, we ask uh, whether, for instance, they still need medication or not, and so we see that about 20% had been medicated but did not require constant medication. And here only four parents reported pharmacoresistant form of epilepsy. And we collaborated now, we collaborate with Dr. Nicole uh, Colo, who is uh, formerly uh, responsible for pharmacovigilance and pharma industry. She helps us uh, to analyze. Uh, the, the, the thing about uh, drug treatment and adverse effect. And so here are the answers, because this is an open answer, where the parents write about whether there was following medication uh, adverse effect. And you see here, Depakot became aggressive and violent. In French, Micropakin lui a fait prendre plus de 10 kilos en un an, weight gain of 10 kilograms. Then Kepra, but there was also adverse effects on And now she takes Epitoma. And here Kepra, she became very agitated and irritable. So we have a lot of answers from parents about, especially for epilepsy drug, about potential adverse effect. Apparently none is totally surprising, but still it's interesting to see. And in order to have more data about this, we sent a single email in English and French to the participating families 
and we got 63 answers were documenting more this uh, this problem of uh, whether they took drug, which drug, whether the drug was seen efficient or not, or whether there was an adverse effect. And this allowed us to actually get this type of information, which you would not find in the literature. And you see, for instance, that these are the two most prescribed drugs, levetiracetam or Keppra or Valproate. And in dark green, it's whether they were thought to be good, efficient or not. So you see that most of them seem to be efficient. And these are uh, less used uh, drug like oxycabalabin, but that seems to be good also. But here you have the reported secondary event. And although it's probably not statistically significant, it seemed that with a similar efficacy, Kepra has more uh, secondary adverse effect and especially uh, some really uh, bad one than valproate. So uh, in a way, it could help doctors to start on one rather than the other because there are data that this worked or not. We can also, I told you that we can do natural history. Now, it's not by following for 10 years a given patient, but by having in the cohort patients of different ages. And for instance, we ask about speech and language acquisition. And at the current time, uh, do they speak with full correct sentence or sentence but often incorrect or just single words? Are they difficult to understand? Are they not able to speak? And here we compared three different conditions, Kuhlen de Vries, Kleftra syndrome, and the KBG syndrome, because these are uh, our larger cohorts. And we can see, depending on this, that actually with respect to speech and language, the more severe with the, the uh, most uh, people who are having uh, difficulties with, with uh, speech and language is actually uh, Kleftar syndrome. The milder one is KBG and Kuhlen de Vries in the middle. But we can see that, uh, let's say, about 50% of uh, the KDVS patients end up with having language communication about okay. Okay, and here is uh, age of first word. This confirms that in, indeed Kleftra syndrome is the uh, most uh, uh, important. And especially here, I think it's interesting that we ask the question, can they be in, understood by the family or can they be understood by somebody foreign to the family? And you see that, for instance, with Kleftra syndrome, uh, two thirds apparently cannot be understood uh, by uh, strangers, while two, two thirds can be understood by the family. So again, it says that for uh, Kleftra syndrome, speech, a big problem, but not so much for, uh, for instance, uh, KBG syndrome. And here about behavior, we can compare for the three, uh, whether uh, impulsivity as a problem, for instance, it seems to be in KBG syndrome, but not at all in KDVS. Uh, aggressiveness does not seem too much, but maybe in Kleftra syndrome, yes. And so we can start to have data on behavior. And I will finish very quickly. Uh, the respiratory pulmonary problems, this is interesting because as I said, it's not reported in a published paper. 40% of the parent report this and they reported uh, asthma also laryngomalacia, tracheomalacia, this was known. They thought that pulmonary problem was a problem in 30% of the cases when they have, uh, when they have it. Uh, but we had forgotten to ask a question of inf uh, infectious problem, respiratory infectious problem, like coronavirus. Okay. And this is what the parents wrote in what really affect the most the health. Recurring bouts of pneumonia, repetitive pneumonia, pneumonia with hospitalization, repeated pneumonia, reoccurring pneumonia, bacterial and viral pneumonia, pneumonia until approximately 10 years old. Now, nobody had ever published anything about this, but David Cullen actually found examples that indeed 
you know, this was true. So this is an example that we can really find through par uh, parents' participation things that were not known previously. Uh, there is no mention in gene review of this. There is no mention in OMIM. Uh, it's actually briefly cited in a unique guideline, repeated infection, including chest infection, are often troublesome, uh, but it's not documented, you know, it's just a, a word. And we have an advisory meeting that uh, takes place uh, every year at ESHG and with about uh, 30 colleagues from uh, 10 different countries who participate with this. And I uh, thank you and uh, for, uh, I'll think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Louis. We have some questions, actually, that people have been writing to us. So Bev asked, how many questions did you ask the parents in total? So um, we have 46 main questions. Five of them are these open questions where they can write one line or uh, two pages about uh, major uh, health problems major behavioral and cognitive problems, adverse effects of uh, uh, drugs, and quality of, life, uh, quality of life problems, okay? Then we have a few numerical questions like weight, uh, and of course, at which age, etc., cetera, or uh, uh, APCAR score at birth, etc. And then we have about, uh, I think, 37 multiple choice questions that explore the wall medical field, like, you know, are there hearing problems? Are there cardiac problems? Are there problems with uh, motor problems? And if they say no, there is no other sub-question. If they say yes, uh, we will then uh, propose uh, various options for cardiac problems or various options for kidney problems. And they can always write a complement open text, which can be uh, very useful. Very good, thank you. I think that answers the other question that was asking if you do, you explain the respiratory and pro pulmonary problems. So you say you provide different options once they select that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, the, someone, um, Larry says, uh, it seems to be a pretty long questionnaire to go through for carers. If we were to encourage uh, our parents and families to take part, what would be the two, three key points to highlight to them so to convince them to participate? Yeah, okay, actually, we have exactly the data because we know, and this is actually on the PDF, at which time they answered the first question and if they answered the whole thing, at which time they answered the last question. They can do it, they don't need to answer all questions. They can do it in two, at two different times. They can go back. For instance, if they say the child at the age of four had no epilepsy, but at the age of five, he started to have epilepsy they can go back and say, now he has epilepsy. We will know that in 2018, he didn't have epilepsy, and in 2019, he had. Now, we can see that it takes about one to one and a half hour for each person. Now, of course, if they went to look for all the drugs, you know, for, you know we have some adult patients, and if they went to, to search for all the medical problems and drugs, uh, some uh, probably spend two or three hours, but most of the people, it's multiple choice question. If there is no cardiac problem, there is no sub question. And did you commission a software program, asks Bev, or did you use an available software to? No, we, to we, we, we commissioned because we at least didn't find anything that would, and also about the, the aspect of uh, uh, anonymous, etc. So uh, this has been. We have been very keen on, so it was developed uh, in-house. Great, thank you. I think, Bruce, you have raised your hand. You had a question, maybe? Let us know if yes. <laughs> if not, if not, uh, I think you've addressed, actually, the, the other questions of the duration. So thank you so much. And, uh, you know, uh, if people are uh, interested, they can uh, uh, write me an email and I can uh, give them more and uh, of course uh, uh, look at the uh, website thank you thank you Not so fun. much Jean-Louis for being with us and uh, we will be